Hi, welcome. This is my third data update for 2018. In this one, I'd like to give you the big picture of the data updates that I do at the start of every year. For most of the last three decades, I've spent the first week of every year going through what I call playing Moneyball. I essentially look at every publicly traded company on the face of the earth, and in this I'm aided and abetted by my raw data providers. I gather together the data on these companies, and then I essentially look at every conceivable ratio, multiple financial measure that I can think of for each of the companies. At the end of the process, I provide averages, summaries for what the world looks like across regions, across sectors, and I hope you find this data useful. So let me start off by describing what my sample is and why I use the sample that I do. I look at every publicly traded company which has a market price. That's pretty much every publicly traded stock. There are 40, 43,000 plus companies. Now in doing this, of course, I'm including some really small companies, some very, very liquid companies and markets where trading hardly ever happens. You might wonder why I don't subsample and remove companies from my overall sample. I feel that every time you remove companies from your universe, you are creating bias. And to prevent bias, I've kept every publicly traded company in the sample, and I will provide weighted averages so that these small companies, these illiquid companies, don't have a disproportionate role in the averages that I report. In terms of geographies, there are more than 150 countries where these companies are incorporated. I don't want to break these companies down across countries because the breakdown is not going to be very useful. So I break them down by broad geographies and you're not going to like some of the classifications I make. Broadly speaking, there are five groups of companies I look at. The first are US companies. Why? It's purely selfish reason. I have had US data going back to 1992 and I can see trend lines by looking at the US data. In addition, the US is the biggest portion of the overall global market in terms of market cap. I look at Japanese companies. Again, it might be a residue of history, but Japanese companies I think are unique enough to be looked at separately. I look at Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. You may say, what do they have in common? They're natural resource dependent countries, and I included companies in those countries. And finally, I look at developed Europe, and this is going to be controversial. I include all the EU countries, including the weak ones. I look at the UK, Switzerland, Scandinavia as part of Develop Europe. The rest of the world I treat as emerging markets, and that's a lot of the world. It includes Eastern Europe and Russia. It includes much of Asia other than Japan. It includes Latin America. It includes Africa. It includes the Caribbean. So there's a very big mix of, uh, of countries in this. Just to provide some breakdown, I look at Indian and Chinese companies separately because there are enough companies in those countries that I can look at them as separate subgroups. So broadly speaking, five broad groups and then India and China broken out separately. Looking at how my sample looked at the start, uh, at the start of 2019, there were about 43,800 companies in my sample. And if you look at pure numbers, emerging markets account for about half my sample. But if you look in terms of market cap, the U.S. is still the dominant portion of the pie, with 38% of the market cap. But there are 43,800 companies that I will use in making my analysis. Now, once I have the companies broken down geographically, I then break them down into industries. And this takes a little bit of gymnastics, and again, it reflects a little bit of my history. I don't use industry groupings from my raw data providers, partly because they don't like it when I do. They feel I'm stepping on their domain and I don't blame them. So I've created my own industry groupings for which I have history going back almost 30 years. There are 94 industries that I break companies down into. And these are pretty broad groupings. So my software sector includes you know, hundreds and hundreds of companies. Now you might wonder why I don't break things down more finely into smaller groups, and here's why. The law of large numbers requires large numbers, and if I start breaking industries down into sub-industries, I'll very quickly lose the power of the law of large numbers. So in computing averages, I like having large numbers in my sample. Second, I really believe you get better measures of many of these, these metrics we're going to look at by looking at broader groups. In other words, rather than just look at a small subset of discount retailers, why not look at all retailers or department stores? Basically, by looking at broader groups, I think you get a better sense of profitability, risk, and other measures for different groupings. That said, there will be times we'll be frustrated with my grouping. 
you might be looking at a luxury retail company and when you look at my industry groupings you might find only special retailers and you wish i'd broken down things more more finely but my only consolation to you there is if you are actually looking at a small subgroup of luxury retailers the data is available online often for free that you can create your own sub samples i think the power of my data set is when you want to look at large numbers of companies spread across lots of markets now the largest industries both in terms of number of firms and market cap are captured in this table metals and mining is the largest single sector in terms of number of companies almost 1500 companies and banks are the largest grouping in terms of market cap these are money center banks but basically this is a group this is basically a listing of the 10 largest industries in by by both by both dimensions now a little bit about the data now as i said i spent the first week of 2019 collecting the data some of my data is accounting data and some of it is market data and that creates a bit of a timing problem the accounting data comes from financial statements none of the data that i use is private it's all public information so basically it comes from the most recent financial statements and for most companies even those that even including those that file quarterly statements the most recent financial statements as of the start of 2019 will be the september 30th or maybe even earlier if you have semi annual statements that's what i will have with accounting uh, accounting numbers with market numbers i can get the numbers as of december 31st here's what i'm going to do and you might feel this is an inconsistency but let me explain why i do it for accounting data i'm going to use trailing 12 month numbers which basically will be through the most recent quarter september 30th if you are a company with reports you know, which has a calendar year end for market data i'm going to use december 31st data that sounds inconsistent right but here's why i think it makes sense if you're an investor on january 1st investing in ibm or apple or any company your accounting information would be as of september 30th you can't make up stuff that you don't have your market information will be much more updated my rule on consistency is to get the most updated numbers for every single statistic that i'm looking for so i'm going to keep, so keep that in mind when you look at the data it will reflect trailing 12 month numbers to september 30th for accounting data and and december 31st numbers for market data i take the accounting numbers but i second guess the accountants and i'm not shy about doing this accountants are not always consistent there are two items that i've consistently adjusted for for the last 30 years the first is leases i think lease commitments are debt they've always been debt no matter what accountants have told us so i've always treated them as debt and converted lease commitments to debt i've been doing this since 1992 and i'm glad to know that accountants finally are coming to their senses in 2019 both ifrs and gap will require that lease commitments be treated as debt you will get an advanced view of what this will do to your data by just looking at the because i compute numbers both before the lease commitments are treated as debt and after so you can see how margins and invested capital and return on capital are going to change at companies when this happens in 2019 i've also treated r&d as a capex because to me r&d is for for the future who does r&d to get benefits this year so i capitalize r&d here the accountants haven't come to their senses yet but they will at some point in time now i will provide the numbers both before and after i make the adjustments in case you don't like my adjustments now i will report a bunch of statistics too many for me to list completely but this table kind of captures some of the broad classes i report on risk measures starting with beta because i use that in my valuation standard deviations in both stock prices and operating income and price variation high low price measures i report profit profit profitability measures return margins profit margins returns on capital returns on equity basically accounting returns and accounting profitability measures i also compute cost of equity debt and capital for for companies i report on leverage debt to equity ratios debt to capital ratios both in book value terms and market value terms as as well as de- as interest coverage debt debt coverage ratios debt to ebitda i report on dividends and buybacks how those have shifted over time i also report on pricing metrics price earnings ratios peg ratios price to book and enter- essentially every conceivable multiple you can think of i have add-ons on terms of cash flows capex numbers working capital numbers 
sales to invested capital numbers. And finally, I have risk premiums, equity risk premiums historically for the US and risk equity risk premiums by country at the start of 2019. Now you're welcome to use my data and I will not second guess what you do. You will find your own uses for it. It would be presumptuous of me to tell you how to use the data, but I'll offer you three caveats as somebody who's been using this data for, for almost 30 years. First is, as you look at this data and you look at averages, don't assume that mean reversion is automatic. I know a lot of investing is built on the presumption that things revert back to the mean and it's a powerful force, but it's not immutable. There will be times when there have been structural shifts, and I believe there have been in the economy and in particular sectors, we will never go back to the mean. Second, I have computed numbers. I have computed ratios based on my understanding of them. EB to EBITDA, return invested capital, return equity. Don't take my definition as the right one. It is my definition. You could have a very different one. I've tried to be as open as I can about how I compute these numbers. So if you, if you cannot find how I've done and how I've estimated a number, check out the, the link that I have to, the, to a page where I describe what I do. Third, the data will age and some data will age more than others. I don't think the accounting numbers will age very much, at least on an industry average basis. It's not like the profit margins will change dramatically between 2018 and 2019 for an entire sector. But the pricing numbers could. So the price earnings ratios in the EV tab it does, especially if markets move a lot this year will change. So if you're doing a pricing later in, the, in 2019, it behooves you to get a more updated number than the number you see on my website. I will be updating almost all of these numbers only once every year. So my next update will not be till January 5th, 2000, 2020. But you're welcome to use the data that you find fit. What do I want in return? Absolutely nothing. The very fact that you use my data is great. The fact is I would be computing all these numbers for my own usage anyway. So what does it cost me to share them with you? So if you want to give me thanks, just pass it on. Pass on by sharing what you know and what you have with other people around you. That is the best way to reinforce what you already know or what you've learned. Thank you very much for listening and I will see you soon.